he just set me down after he did a, a, some simple examinations and he told me, Mr. Calhoun, we're going to try to make you as comfortable as we can. And I said, wait a minute, is this a terminal disease? He said, yes, it is. You have a terminal disease and you won't survive this and you have two months to two years to live. Pulmonary diseases, chronic pulmonary diseases, are the third leading cause of death in this country, but even more importantly, they have a singularly devastating impact on mental well-being, unlike any other diagnosis. So pulmonary diseases are unique in the way that they impact mental well-being. They're devastating and they require constant care. Immediately, I was not going to accept this diagnosis. It couldn't be real. <laughs> One cannot do very well at all as a, as a pulmonary fibrosis patient without a, 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 a caring, involved caregiver. I'm constantly wondering, what can I do to make life better for my husband? And I go to his doctor's appointments with him as much as I can. I remember one of the doctors turning to me and asking me, what do you do for yourself? I nearly started crying because I had no answer for him. The burden is greater for caregivers even than for the patient, which may not intuitively make as much sense, but we know that sometimes the healthcare outcomes and the mental health outcomes for caregivers are worse than is true for the patients themselves. It's not unusual for a caregiver to begin to stuff emotions, especially if he's uh, been grumpy about something. And he used to start stuffing them, thinking, oh, this will pass, or, you know, it's not worth talking about. And then if you do, you've done that 10 or 20 times, the tiny thing he might do later on is like, ah, you know, <laughs> those emotions do come out, you yeah, know, they, and they're not they're beautiful. <laughs> The range of emotional reactions really is vast, and I would go so far as to say that there's no abnormal reaction, short of being downright self-destructive. Importantly, though, what you see in the dynamics in partnerships, for example, so in a couple where one of those persons is a caregiver to the other, is that they're going through those stages of reactions in very different ways and at different times. It's almost never the case that a patient and their partner caregiver are experiencing the same reaction at the same time. So allowing each other a bit of grace to have those reactions is really the key to a successful relationship in that way. My, the thing that I have to struggle with is, uh, is being self-aware and realizing that I, I do feel bad but I am a person in the world. I do have a relationship with people and I should be respectful of their, of their boundaries. I, and I do know that I, I need to get in, in touch with myself. And I went back to doing meditation because it really is one of the ways that I can get centered again. So yeah, she, she carves out her own her own space, and, uh, and I try to respect that as much as I can. She likes her quiet time in the morning. Uh, she gets up and feeds the dogs and uh, has her coffee and reads the paper. I crawl out of bed and after an hour or so of that, and then usually when I go to the kitchen, she goes back to the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> we do things together, and uh, we also have our alone time. She encourages me to go out to the studio. <laughs> I am an artist, so I like to paint. And now that I'm retired, uh, my passion still is uh, art and, and making art. It's become very urgent to me to, uh, to try to produce some paintings before my time is up. <clears throat> it's as important to me as breathing. My advice to other people who go through this diagnosis as a, uh, as a couple would be to get to a support group as soon as possible where you can talk to other people who are like you, um, who are fighting this disease, ch making lifestyle changes. They need inspiration. They need information. They need to know what's in store. We're constantly reminded that we're not alone. I think of support groups as the number one first line of mental well-being. You know, you're, you're looking for your people, <laughs> people like you that understand. <laughs>